Coming up on Digital Music Trends 223 on the 11th of March 2015, all the latest on the Blurred Lines lawsuit as we hear directly from Richard Bush, the lawyer who represented the Marvin Gaye estate. Also, Rock Band 4 is announced. Can console music games make a comeback? McDonald's decides to pay bands after the South by Southwest controversy. The German music industry's results for 2014. Spotify's desktop tweaks. The Songwriter Equity Act. Cobalt's $60 million round and the more South by Southwest tips from our guests. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. You can send your music to the Gramophone right from the Spotify app. And from that moment, the device will bypass your phone and stream directly from the Spotify servers, which means that your phone won't run out of charge and you'll be able to receive notifications and calls without interrupting your music experience. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Nelly and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And the show can be downloaded as a podcast either in its video or audio form. You can find it on pretty much any podcatching app available for Android or iOS. And if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, you can do so on bit.ly slash DMT list. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome first up a new guest to the show, Joe Conyers, General Manager at SongTrust and VP of Technology at Downtown Music Publishing. So hi, Joe, and thank Thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And it's always a pleasure to have uh, 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 Jim Carroll on the show, a music and music industry journalist at the Irish Time, or you should head right now and subscribe to his On The Record blog, as well as uh, check out his fantastic banter podcast. So hi, Jim, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, Andrew. How are you? Great, thank you. It's all going pretty well, I think. Uh, and it's great to hear the sounds of uh, New York in the background. We uh, lots of uh, uh, things happening uh, over there. At uh, uh, is it your nine o'clock in the morning, isn't it, or ten o'clock? Ten o'clock, right? That's yeah, it, ten a.m. Yeah. We're in that weird uh, time-space continuum uh, that always happens around South by, which really messes up everybody's uh, schedules. Uh, where uh, there is a one hour less difference between the UK and the US, and so uh, that makes it fun for schedules and scheduling. And uh, uh, so. Uh, a couple of announcements before we start. Uh, first of all, you will have seen uh, at the beginning of the show uh, that DMT, DMT has a new sponsor in Gramophone uh, for the next few weeks. Uh, so I've been using it a lot. Uh, and if you have speakers that are good but aren't smart, uh, this is a pretty good uh, little black box. So definitely checking out, uh, if, especially if you are a Spotify user, it works really well with Spotify. And the other thing I wanted to say is, is that um, I've been in touch with the Pavlov Foundation, which is a fantastic uh, uh, cancer uh, research. Uh, foundation, uh, especially uh, uh, looking at pedi- pediatric cancer, and they're having a, an event in LA. She talked about uh, about that last year, actually, for the second edition. Now it's the third uh, edition of their. Uh, of their uh, um, rock and roll golf tournament uh, and so if you are in LA and you want to give something uh, towards uh, uh, fighting childhood uh, childhood cancer and also have fun uh, in in a uh, interesting golf uh, rock setting uh, go and check out pablov.org and you'll find more information on the foundation there and uh, so this week uh, let's uh, I want to start by talking about the uh, blurred lines it's been a headline news uh, all over really as the jury found that the song had infringed on the rights of the Marvin Gaye estate due to similarities with the 90 77 track got to give it up. Uh, I really quite an extraordinary story. And first up, uh, uh, here is a quick interview that I recorded with uh, the uh, lawyer for the gay family. It's a real pleasure to be here with Richard Bush, Nashville-based uh, entertainment attorney with uh, King and Ballo. So hi, Richard, and thanks for joining me today. I'm, I bet it's been a long day already. It has, and it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, congratulations on, on yesterday's uh, result. And uh, uh, this trial has been extraordinary in many uh, respects, uh, starting with the fact that the songwriters of Blurred Lines actually sued the gay estate uh, for expressing some doubts about the originality of the song. So how, how did the, 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 the whole trial start, uh, considering that first advance on their part? Well, um, obviously, it's an unusual um, thing to do, a strategy. Um, I think, it's my opinion, that uh, Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke were probably advised that if they file this lawsuit, the gays would not have the wherewithal or the will or the money to fight and would just shrink away like violets. Right. Uh, but they were mistaken. 
Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, uh, the other extraordinary thing is the fact that uh, you couldn't actually play the entirety of the original song, right? Because uh, uh, the suit was about the publishing rights and, and, and the gay family didn't have uh, the rights to the master. And so how did you get around that? Well, that's actually a, a misconception that I'd like to clear up, if that's okay. Sure, of course, yeah. Even, yeah, so w it, even though the song was about the composition, that is, the gay family owns the musical composition, that does not prevent the playing of the sound recording in general. Right. You, the composition is embodied in the sound recording. So, in our view, the composition and the recording are one and the same. That's the, that, the recording is the way that the composition is expressed. What this court held, first ruling of its kind, was that because Got to Give It Up was created and deposited with the Copyright Office before 1978, and because before 1978 a composition owner could not file the recording as a deposit copy, but could only right. file written notation, sheet music, lead sheets, that we were limited in our claim to those elements that were on the lead sheet. And because there were certain elements that the court said were not on the lead sheet, he said that playing the recording would expose the jury to those elements and therefore would not allow us to play the recording. I do not agree with that decision. And if this ever went to an appeal, I think we would have won that. But even without being able to play the recording, even with one arm tied behind my back, even maybe even say one and a half arms tied behind my back, uh, we were able to win by playing excerpts from the Got to Give It Up recording that were protected according to the judge's ruling and compare those to blurred lines and the similarity was apparent to anyone who heard it and uh, that helped us win the case. And so one of the interesting things, you talked about the fact that you were only able to play uh, excerpts from, from the song, but at the same time you talked about the fact that uh, uh, one of the, the key points was that the jury's mandate was not to find the two tracks identical, was to find essentially the, the musical uh, overall similarities between the two pieces. And that's sort of where it becomes interesting because a lot of the lawsuits over the last few years have been focused around specific s s samples, perhaps of much smaller portions of music. And so how did you convey that uh, sort of over overarching similarity between the two pieces uh, to the jury? So um, there's two tests that are relevant. There's what's called the concept and feel test, where you compare the works in total and you decide whether the concept and feel are the same and whether there was copyright infringement. The other um, test is what's called the qualitative or quantitative importance test. And for our purposes, based on your question, the focus would be on the qualitative importance. And, the, and the, what that says is even if a small part is taken, if it was important to the original song, that can be copyright infringement. So we were able to show both that qualitatively important portions of Got to Give It Up were copied, vocal melodies and, and things of that nature, and also um, portions that ran throughout the entirety of both songs, such as the baseline keyboard combination, which we called the heartbeat of the songs. Yeah. So by doing that, we showed that there was copying and copyright infringement. And our experts, I have to say, Judith Fennell is a genius, and Ingrid Munson from Harvard University is a genius, and they broke this thing down to its constituent elements and showed note for note copying. Uh, it was really incredible what they did, and the jury heard it and saw it. Yeah. This year we've seen uh, already one uh, interesting case where Sam Smith, for example, conceded part of his royalties uh, for Stay With Me to Tom Petty due to the similarities with the track I Won't Back Down. And in fact, it's been a while since we've seen such a high profile case because a lot of these cases are, are settled out of court uh, and, and it doesn't go to trial. So uh, do you think that this uh, particular result will spur more, uh, will encourage more of these sort of settlements out of court and, and sort of uh, uh, let people know that this kind of thing can happen? And actually, if there is a similarity, the the uh, the uh, jury is likely to find for for the the claimant. Um, I would think that people who are smart and who have copied and who get caught should probably resolve the claims and not go to trial. Right. And so, um, in terms of appeal, uh, what do you think is going to happen now? Um, everyone who loses says they're going to appeal, and um, everyone who loses has excuses for why they lost. But I don't see any valid basis for any appeal. They won the evidentiary rulings that they sought to win, which was to bar the playing of the entirety of Got to Give It Up. They got that. Um, we just won a case, a music case, where we couldn't play the entirety of our music. Um, so um, I think that they have no appeal. 
they got what they wanted. Uh, they just lost. And they lost because we were right and we proved it. And finally, you know, talking about the, the, the emotional aspect of the of the, the lawsuit, it's, it was interesting to see that bo from both sides, really, there was quite a lot of emotions that ran through uh, it. And I, I could see somebody standing behind you in, at, at the uh, press conference yesterday that I assume was from, from the gay estate that uh, f uh, was quite emotional about the ruling. And so w what was the toll on them? And, and, you know, what does this mean for them? Well, they still, believe it or not, 30 years later, are heartbroken at the death of their father and their husband. Marvin Gaye died tragically, Obviously. as you may or may not know. And um, Nona Gaye was nine years old at the time. I think in many ways she feels robbed of not having her father with her for her entire life. And she felt like she was doing something for him that he would have done if he were here. And you can just imagine how emotional something like that would be for a child to do something for their deceased father and then be successful, particularly against you know people of the stature of Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke, um, it's an incredible accomplishment. And it was a long road. Um, they started this fight. We ended it. And um, it's incredibly satisfying for them on a very personal level that I think you might be able to understand now. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, Richard, I won't keep you anymore. I'm, I'm sure you've had a long day. And if uh, my listeners want to know more about you, there's a, a couple of really interesting pieces that came out. There's one on Billboard that came out today on, on a profile about you, uh, outlining some of the, the, the key cases you worked on in the past and uh, some uh, really interesting history there. I would love to have you back on the show at some point when you had more sleep and talk about it. <laughs> Anytime. If, if I can just make one last comment. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. The last, thing, yeah, the last thing I'd like to say is that um, this was not, as Mr. Williams and his legal team keep saying, the copying of a genre or an era or a feeling. This was a copying of a musical composition. There's no great change in the law that's going to result from this. This will not stifle artistic creativity. This was copyright infringement and nothing more. Right. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, just uh, to, to you know, sort of to draw a bit of a conclusion around that and on what your thoughts are on the ruling. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, and you work in publishing, obviously an interesting ruling for, from your end. What do you make of it? Uh, this year has been an interesting one. We haven't had these kind of blockbuster publishing cases in some time, and certainly not since I've really been in the industry at this size. And I think it's, you, you do see when people admit that they did something and they, they make it right, people are, are, they respect that. Whereas this giant lawsuit in the, in the, publicity and the tabloids around it has just been going on and on and uh, it, it sounds like a great you know relief for the uh, gay estate uh, usually these things have some sort of other backstory that doesn't come out in the press where maybe they did go to the estate and ask for some permissions or maybe they did say well maybe we did this by accident yeah but <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, it, it was an interesting one, especially as, as uh, you know, when we first reported on this, uh, and, and then it kind of, it was never talked about again, uh, but I, I think as the lawyer said, uh, they couldn't talk about it. Uh, th it was actually, uh, you know, th the uh, songwriters for, from, from uh, Blurred Lines that had sued the gay estate for sort of mentioning that there might have been a similarity between the songs. So they sort of preemptively sued them, which was, wasn't, didn't turn out to be a very good move, right, Jim? No, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I, I thought it was, it was fascinating. I mean, as you just said there, Andrea, I mean, this case has been, has been rolling for a, a long time. It's been, it's been in the music industry dispatches, I'd say, for the clubs of nine months, you know. And I, I, I thought, you know, I, I thought the most interesting thing that came out of it was just the, the money. You rarely see mention of money of that scale, yeah. uh, like on that kind of scale. You kind of find out how much the publishers got, how much the labels would have got, how much, you know, Mr. Tick and Mr. Williams got as well. So, I mean, <laughs> you, you can see that, like, I mean, you know, it's not even just a case of where there's a hit, there's a rich. Where there's a hit, there's a big lot of money as well, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the $7.4 million damages is not really, it's not really going to take much out, out of the two lads, you know, to be honest. But, like, it's just that, that, that when the money comes out, you suddenly see that, like, even in these days when people give out about Spotify, Spotify returns when people kind of talk about streaming, the physical sales, yada, yada, yada. There's still money to be made and a lot of money at that as well. 
Yeah, and, and it's kind of interesting to see here that you know it was calculated that the song made about around 16 million dollars, but uh, this was across a, a huge variety of, of revenue streams, and so I, 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 it's just really interesting to see how that money is going to be recovered because you know. Uh, on the one side, obviously, it was, it was a, a suit around songwriting, but I think a lot, a lot of what happened was also, you know, and, and around the revenues. Uh, I'm not sure if that it was pertaining only to the songwriting rights or if that ha touched the, the master rights in any way. I don't know, Joe. Did you did you read anything on that? I don't know the details of everyone's contract there. Yeah. Um, typically, there would be some sort of clawback uh, clause if the lawyers are smart to, you know, make sure that they're covered and. Uh, on both sides. Now, yeah. it could be that Robin Thicke's completely on the hook for this. It could be that the publishers partially, whomever else is involved. Um, you know, there are there are whole classes of uh, different types of, of deals that could have been done. So, exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever know. The, yeah, because because the, the headline, you know, it is that you know the songwriters will pay back the money. Essentially, you know, uh, that Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams, uh, you know, will be liable to pay some of the money back. But at, at the same time, I know that the, the publisher, for example, would have earned uh, quite a bit of money from those rights as well. And so uh, it'd be interesting to know how that that, that pay, payment is going to be structured. But you know, uh, not not much else to talk about on this on that particular case. But uh, one story that I wanted to follow up uh, that with uh, uh, totally different, but still talking about sync. Uh, was to talk about Rock Band. So Rock Band has been such a random uh, disappearance in, in, in the world of gaming. You know, uh, they, they had a bit of a you know rough patch in 2011 with the, you know in, it was 20 when was it 20. 12, 2013, when the last uh, game was uh, released, uh, uh, Rock Band 3, uh, they didn't sell as much as, as, as they thought they would, but nobody expected for the brand to be completely halted, for the game to be completely halted, and for nothing to come out, uh, come out of there again for, for, for the next few years. The same happened with, with Guitar Hero. We haven't seen uh, uh, anything uh, come out of that. And uh, also Guitar Hero uh, looks like it has, has another uh, installment in the works, but especially Rock Band, we had an announcement from, from Harmonix, uh, the developer of the game, that Rock Band 4 is in the works and will come out later this year. Uh, so uh, this is uh, particularly exciting for us in the music business because uh, uh, Rock Band and, and Guitar Hero came to constitute quite quite a hefty, uh, uh, quite quite a good uh, amount of revenues for music in, for the music industry, uh, given their extensive catalog and the fact that they were charging good money for uh, adding new tracks, and a lot of the money went uh, back uh, to uh, labels, publishers, and, and song song songwriters. And so, uh, from that perspective, you know, what do you make of this comeback, uh, uh, Jim? Do you think that uh, uh, there is still space for these music games, uh, uh, given that there's there's pretty much nothing on consoles at the moment. Mm. I mean, here's it, 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 a very interesting proposition because you just outlined that the amount of revenues that can come from, the, from, from a successful game like this are huge, you know? But, like, it, it depends on, like, what they're going to actually do. I mean, how are, are they going to retool it? I mean, when people talk about games now, it's, it's, I, I haven't heard anyone talk about, talk about, like, music games like this in quite some time. I mean, is, is it going to be retooled for a new audience? Is it going to, like, try and attract in a new audience? I mean, where exactly are they going to come from? The thing yeah. about it is, though, and it's funny, when you sent through the sheet, earlier on and very kind of saying the various topics. I was going, oh yeah, I mean, you know, I don't play games, but I rec recognize that name. There's immediate brand rec re recognition factor there. Yeah. And what's, what's that worth now? I mean, is, is that worth something in, 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 this in this age? I mean, but like, I suppose all bets are off if you actually see the game and actually get, I suppose, impressions from those who play it regularly, what they actually make of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a same perspective, Joe, I guess uh, it, it would be nice to see them come back, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I entered this business uh, four, three, four years ago, five years ago now, and uh, everyone talked about how that really replaced the revenue from ringtones uh, yeah. as, as a, you know, kind of a portion of revenue. It's, it's kind of a market that is just disappeared on us in the last year, two, three years. What did come up in, in to replace it was the kind of app market for syncs, and that's a huge growth market I see. For publishers and for for labels, uh, you know, for mobile apps and iPhone, and, uh, you know, iPad, etc. Now, uh, whether or not the you know another rock band can succeed, I think they they saw they they kind of glutted the market with uh, <laughs> three three you know four uh, episodes of the same game over and over and over again. Yeah. And there were so many Me Too's in the space. It was also getting pretty expensive on the licensing, I think, for them. And the options were starting to renew, and people were wondering, well, is this worth it? You know, is this, is this actually going to be a sustainable business? Um, which, you know, for a lot of these, these uh, publishers who are the resellers for these games, the, the game publishers, 
the options get quite expensive and, and complicated to to execute. So yeah. uh, it'll be a, it'll be interesting to see. I'm I'm actually curious if they'll end up going after the EDM space at all because that was the one thing mm-hmm. that. Um, the rock band like franchise never attacked at least from my at least as far as I know uh, it seems like that kind of would be an interesting uh, you know maybe a collaboration between a, a, a manufacturer of, of uh, Dax. you know yeah a, a DAC or something like that to to, uh, to do some sort of collaboration yeah that'd be mm-hmm. interesting I mean I I remember last year at South by Southwest, I met somebody from Rock Band, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and I was surprised to, you know, to see somebody from, from that kind of uh, environment because uh, they hadn't done anything for ages. And so I, yeah. I asked them what the plans were. And you know, obviously, he didn't say anything, but it didn't sound like there was a lot going on, especially on the mobile front, where I expected it'd be a pretty natural extension of that to go into mobile somehow in a, in a big way. But that didn't really happen. So yeah, it's just a... For everybody, even the tech writers that read about uh, that read pieces from, uh, they all said it's kind of a mystery why uh, rock band and guitar hero entirely disappeared from the face of the earth in the space of twelve months. And uh, we'll see if I can make a hunt. It also shows Cap. well up there. I mean, like when Joe was talking there, he mentioned ringtones. I mean, you know, like I mean, what, what, like it's, the revenue sources don't go away. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sure there's still some money being made from ringtones, is there? A little tiny bit. I mean, it's it's clearly not what it was. Uh, there's a lot more action outside the United States, yeah. uh, and there are specific genres of music that do better in the United States still to this day. Right, yeah. right. But yeah, so we'll see what happens with that. But uh, I, I'm I remember working at uh, Universal Music a fair few years ago, and uh, I started out in the archives, and uh, that was one of the big things, you know, to work with the guitar here and get all the multi tracks and get the stems done and all that kind of stuff. So that was a that was a big part of the daily routine, and uh, it'd be nice to see. It's also pretty awesome because it, it encourages preservation of some of the things that perhaps uh, uh, otherwise wouldn't get transferred in, in multi track. If, if I never no, thought about that, that's great. If there's no reason, if there's no reason to do so, because they they, they were paying for the transfer, so. You know, <laughs> that was always helpful, and uh, 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 and so yeah, we'll see what happens with that. And uh, one thing uh, I wanted to mention uh, South by Southwest uh, this week uh, again. You know, after the previous, the first previous that we did last week, uh, uh, you guys both going? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll excellent. be on a panel uh, about collecting uh, royalties from streaming. Awesome, Jim. There, I'm there covering it for the Irish Times, and also on a panel on how a bunch of Irish people put together a pub for five thousand dollars. Oh, nice. Excellent. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, so, uh, it seems like everybody's going. I'm literally like the only person left in London at this point. Uh, but it's fine. I've got an essay to write, so no, no worries there. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things that came up in the last few days was this controversy around McDonald's. And so this is one of those juicy things that comes up. And like, you just kind of, when you read these things, you kind of roll your eyes and think, oh, once again, this happens. But essentially, if you haven't heard about it, uh, what happened is that uh, over the past few days, the, the band X Cops uh, sent a circuit and publicly available response to the McDonald's uh, request for them to play for free at their sponsored events at South by Southwest. So uh, this became like a, a pretty viral post and so uh, the uh, um, corporation obviously had to backtrack. Uh, so uh, they've realized what kind of can of worms they opened by asking uh, bands that can barely make a living to play for free to make their own brand hip again. And so uh, they finally told Billboard uh, yesterday that they would now be paying all the acts performing which is great it's 20 plus acts uh, and uh, you know they, they will uh, uh, support those artists hopefully by with, with a, a decent uh, amount of compensation uh, originally mcdonald's has justified the request to pay bands nothing due to a lack of budget uh, uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny and stated the artists would gain exposure and perhaps be featured on the brand's uh, social channels perhaps that wasn't a, a definite uh, as well and so whilst you know it's true that a lot of bands don't get paid to play a south by southwest uh, it, it certainly doesn't feel okay for a brand to take advantage of that and give Give, uh, you know, away free food and free goodies and pay their staff uh, for a week and their marketeers without paying the artist a few hundred dollars each uh, to be there. And so, uh, you know, on, on this side, it kind of goes back, Jim, to what we were talking about last year uh, after South by Southwest around uh, sort of South by Southwest as an event. Uh, obviously, I'm in the camp uh, that thinks that brands are necessary to make the event happen. Obviously, I'm not anti-brand, but it, it does seem like maybe South by Southwest should do a little bit more to make sure that those brands that are involved with the event uh, also, uh, you know, pay uh, the acts that are paying for their events properly. And I'm sure that's something because South by South by so requested right now it's so hip and people want to be there i'm sure they could put a term in the contract to say look if you are hiring bands to do this you have to pay them at least you know a thousand bucks each or you're not you're not you're not getting them 
Mm. I'm sure they could, and I'm sure they could close in the contracts as well, saying the band should have proper sound checks and line checks, but they're not going to, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really think, I, re- I, I think, you know, this McDonald's, whoever's advising McDonald's on this thing, is they didn't know what they were on about. I mean, yeah. every, everyone knows that South South West, there are big brands there, and those big brands, you said earlier on, Andrea, are like a couple of hundred bucks per band. Listen, like there's bands going out, and I've seen, I, I, I know this, there are bands going out who are getting thousands of dollars to shill for brands, as they should, because these brands have got huge money. They're huge money. If they got money up at like a, a giant skyscraper, like a horrible uh, crisp vending machine like Doritos had, they've got money to pay these acts. And like in the case of X Cops, yeah, they're fair, fair juice them because I mean, someone needs to call 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 uh, cor- corporations and brands or something like this. The thing about McDonald's getting involved in South South West was very interesting to see. I mean, from kind of like my read on things and from talking to a couple of people in Austin, like South, uh, McDonald's are trying to be hip. They're trying to, like, they really are going a hip and hip, n- n- not in the kind of Doritos, Lady Gaga sort of way. They want the hipper bands, they want the kind of like bands that people, the cooler bands. And like, it's, it's interesting because they're, they're not, it seems, oh, I could be wrong on this, but they're not paying for the big Kanye West acts or, yeah. or Jay Z or anything like that. They're going for the smaller acts, acts who are kind of like me associated with South South West long gone by. And like, you know, not paying acts is just not cool. I mean, it reminded me of a great story from, I think it was, I, I might get the festival wrong, I, I think it's either either the uh, Last Street Festival or the V Festival a couple of years ago, when Nando's, the fast food chain, had a stand, and they or had a tent, they weren't paying the acts, so they offered to pay their acts in Nando's food vouchers. You know what I mean? You've heard of food stands, so this is acts who are getting paid for food vouchers. You know, okay, it, 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 admittedly it's a thousand uh, pounds worth of, of, of food vouchers, so that's a lot of Nando's chicken to get through. But someone like the <laughs> I mean, they should know, they really, really should know when they get involved with something like this, that there will be blowback if you don't pay your acts, you know? And South South West this year, I mean, it's interesting, I read, a, I read a piece on Q Point earlier on today about like, kind of like me, by someone, I can't remember who wrote the piece, and he was kind of giving his kind of advanced guide to South South West, and it does really seem this is a kind of a, a weird year for South South West, certainly from the music point of view, for interactive, it's kind of business as usual, even though the number of pounds has been reduced, and it would be interesting to see how the new venue, the Marriott Hotel, kind of uh, dovetails in with everything else. But from a music point of view, there just seems to be as not as much of a buzz around it. And in many ways, that suits me because it means that you're not going to have big acts coming into town and like me, like and taking away all the kind of oxygen of promotion and publicity. But at the same time, you're still going to have the same crowds as before. So are those crowds going to go and see all the new bands or whatever? It's, it, it's an interesting year. It's a year of transition for South South West on many, on many fronts. Yeah. Joe, from, from your point of view, uh, first on the brand and then on the festival itself and what, what you're, what you're uh, looking forward to. Well, I will say, you know, I do have to thank McDonald's for actually giving one of our bands a lot of exposure. We represent X, X Cops. And so they, they did end up, uh, you know, I didn't know that. A, I honestly didn't know that. So. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can't fault them there. I, it's clear that, you know, whatever gaffe they've made in, in no one else will ever do that at South by. So I really do <laughs> yeah. think this is, this is a really positive and reflective moment for everyone. And, yeah. Um, I think the best quote out of it was something like, you know, well, how, how are we going to get paid if we can't get paid for playing shows? And this is, you know, this is probably the most labor-intensive part outside of recording your record in, a, in your band's life. And, yeah. why would, you know, you're asking someone to go and, and haul gear and, and get up there and do all this stuff for a brand that's not really that cool. So you're not really, you're kind of hurting your, your, your cool factor yourself. So you're, you're paying and and giving away your cachet, yeah. and uh, you know, so I think it's it's going to be nice that they are going to end up start paying bands. I think a lot of brands are, will take that and, and realize that they can't do the same. Um, and you know, South by has has continued to grow in terms of I think mainstream understanding and acknowledgement. I think the big turning point there was that when iTunes really came in and did some huge huge uh, concerts and streamed them for free, and then I think uh, we'll continue to see see major major coverage of it I, I just I can't wait until one day it's you know the olympics level coverage of south by you know yeah. it's it's <laughs> we're getting there right it's it's not too far off Absolutely, and, and I think uh, uh, it's going to be interesting because South by is always, uh, you know, they just announced the Snoop Dogg, for example, is one of the keynote speakers, and it's renowned. I mean, one of the exciting things about it is that uh, a lot of the last minute sort of big announcements are made literally like either on the day of you know, of the event starting or just a couple of days before. So uh, I think there might still be some big acts coming to town, but as usual, they probably won't get announced until literally like uh, two or three days before the event starts. So it's going to be interesting to see how that how that all shapes up. And, and, and uh, it does feel like literally everybody I know is going uh, more so than last year, perhaps. So uh, even from the UK. So I wonder if it's going to feel 
more crowded as well than than last year that could be that could be interesting right because it's already pretty crowded <laughs> but mm. <laughs> we're gonna see what happens there it, it comes down to what you're going to south south west for andre i mean like yeah, you know exactly. i mean I, I like i i have two kind of tasks there but i mean one interactive just kind of feed my brain go to as many panels as possible looking for people to speak at banter banter events in the future i have music it's just to see new bands and like there's not a lot of people going around to see a hundred new bands and over the course of South South West. And like you, you there, 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 there's so many parties going on, so many daytime, so many opportunities to see those bands. But I think a lot of people at South South West, outside of kind of like I suppose the industry side, are there for the kind of the spring break party vibe. And like as long yeah. as you avoid anything that's branded like like Samsung or McDonald's or yeah. YouTube or whatever, you get away with that. Right. Well said. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to hopefully maybe next year I'll manage to plan and go without having to do the show like 20 hours a day, uh, which will mean that I will actually be able to have fun and go and see some bands, which uh, uh, is a sort of uh, the reason for going. But last year it was a disaster. I, literally, I probably saw like 20 bands if I was lucky. Uh, and let's talk about uh, the German music industry. So the German music industry is one of the few that this year has reported a growth. And uh, that was... Uh, 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 you know, given actually by a digital, I even though digital is uh, only a small part of uh, the German market, uh, uh, you know, the uh, CD, uh, CDs uh, uh, decline only by 1.5%, the physical market only declined by 1.5%, uh, uh, whilst, uh, you know, the, the growth by 1.8 was uh, driven by the uh, rise in digital. So uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, an interesting dynamic here because obviously uh, in a lot of the other markets around the world we've seen a much steeper decline of CD sales uh, obviously CD sales are uh, uh, far uh, you know amount for to, uh, to far less than the 75% of, of, of uh, all revenues that uh, the, the CD and, and vinyl sale uh, amount to in Germany uh, but it, the market is sort of achieving some sort of weird balance somehow it's probably due to the habits uh, uh, of people there and how people are used to purchasing music but the transition in into uh, uh, you know the streaming space is not happening quite as, as fast, uh, and, and and that sort of is, is helping the industry as a whole. Uh, so you know uh, the the market was also dominated by national artists with German pop productions increasing sales by 16.6 percent, whilst international acts in interestingly lost out with an 18.3 percent decline, and uh, downloads are still dominating uh, the digital market with uh, 66 percent of all digital revenues coming from uh, still uh, the downloads of tracks. Uh, Streaming and downloads are now, as I said, responsible for 25% of recorded music revenues. Uh, so, uh, Jim, any thoughts on, uh, you know, you know, obviously we can't really speculate on what happened there because it's such a different market. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you think that this is something that might just continue on this nice level curve like it has? Or uh, is it a market where th there might be a pretty uh, fast shakeup once uh, people start switching services? Well, I think being the person you need to bring in here will be a German real estate or reader to find out what the story is. I mean, like, are, 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 like, I mean, is it the case of record shops? Do the record shops still exist there? And yeah, if so, like, I mean, is there very low? Is there very low rents? Is there very low rates? Because I mean, when there's a, when there's a large physical uh, uh, revenue amount of revenue coming from that particular sector, as, as is the case with German, German market, the shops are still open, obviously, and they're still flogging CDs. So I mean, like, I mean, that's that's interesting for a start, you know. And like, I, I do I do know because I mean, being Irish, of course, we always have an interest in property markets and. We, like Irish speculators have bought into the German market. They bought into the German market for the last 10, 15 years because on a real estate level, it was, it was worth their while because of, the way, because of the way it was structured and the money that was being demanded. But like I also do, I also do know as well that like I mean, the terms and conditions for kind of commercial space, res residential and commercial spaces are quite, are quite favorable to the tenants. So that's one thing to definitely look at. The second thing I suppose is like, I mean, you talked there about like, you know, the downloads are still dominating the market. So there has been some budging. There has been some moving away from physical to, to kind of like, I mean, downloads. It depends. Like, I mean, are, are they waiting for a kind of like, a, like, a, like you know, a, a a particular service to come on board? I mean, you know, mo like, you know, I know it's Germany, but like, I mean, like m most people the world over have moved on. You know, they have they like they they def they definitely have even here in Ireland, which is kind of like a, wouldn't be exactly kind of like a an outlier when it comes to this kind of thing. I mean, definitely the move is on moves on to digital and particular streaming right now. So why are the Germans staying behind? I think that the the when you, when you talk there about the national artist sales, I mean that is significant. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's something that's like if you've got a bunch of national artists in somewhere like Germany who are doing really really well from physical sales, well then they've got no particular reason or no particular I suppose you know uh, obligation or necessity to move to streams. Because I mean obviously if they're selling physical products, they're making more money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Joe, I guess uh, you know the US would probably quite happily trade off with Germany, given that last year we saw quite a steep decline in city sales once again. Yeah, I mean. 
as a business, we we are probably less reliant on physical than most other publishers, given our, you know, we've been only around seven years or so, eight years. Yeah. And uh, so we never saw that big mechanical run up. So we kind of never really thought about that. But I did see was interesting in that, uh, in that read was, you know, they're about, I think, 59 euros was the, uh, you know, average physical sales buyer. Which is actually pretty close to the American, uh, you know, given the exchange rate. I think it's about si- somewhere between sixty and eighty dollars in America. Yeah. And uh, you know, Dr. Buddha there, who's actually our our sub publisher in Germany, talks about how twenty five streams is is one download, and I think that's you know that's great. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't see. I think he's a little more reluctant there, but. Uh, you know, I wish we got those kind of rates all over the all over the world. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, you know, it's it's a market where I think that a couple national acts can blow it out. I don't know if there was a big Eurovision thing this year or, or what the kind of what the driver there was uh, in terms of physical. Maybe there were some certain acts that that blew it out. I mean, yeah. This the the scale of the market's so small that you know when Adele puts a record out. It, Boy, you know, or Beyonce puts the record out in America, it blows everything up, or in, in England and UK. So I don't know if that's the driver, or if there were actually just maybe a better record business as usual yeah. day. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's funny because uh, I, I went to a panel. It was last March or last uh, February, or something in Hamburg, and uh, I kind of came came away from it. Uh, a little worried about the general music industry because it felt like the distributors that were on the panel were essentially dismissing digital still and saying, oh, it's an experiment, you know, for us, it's mm-hmm. kind of like a sideline business. Mm-hmm. And, and, and all the focus was still on physical. And I thought, you know, oh, wow, that this is kind of crazy. But, uh, you know, it seems like these kind of numbers vindicate the attitude because, uh, you know, physical is maintaining that edge because of the effort that they're putting into, you know, putting out good physical, uh, uh, you know, physical products, but digital is not doing badly. So, you know, on that front this is still a market that doesn't have youtube um yeah. so there are some pretty significant gaps in terms of their streaming prowess uh and and video prowess and so you don't have the same level of i think uh ubiquity that you have here in the states or in other other countries mm. and also i mean like you know when the when they talk about I suppose the emphasis on physical because the sales are there. I mean, that's kind of like the same sort of thing which you heard in the music industry here in, in, in the UK and the US in the 1990s when you had a C, when you had a big CD boom. Like no one ever thought that would end, and it ended ended spectacularly. And like there was a big shakeout. So maybe you know, like you know, whatever the Germans are smoking, we'd like some of that because I mean, it, it, inevitably it's going to happen. It has to happen. It, 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 there's no there's no there's no there's no reason why. Like there will be kind of like I mean one one one, one co- country happily kind of like I mean uh, like consuming CDs while everyone else has moved on to something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's talk about uh, art for a little bit uh, because uh, Bjork's exhibition opened up in uh, at MoMA uh, uh, this week, or at least the, the, the you know the critics were in, the, the 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 reviews were in uh, uh, last week, and uh, uh, they were pretty much uh, universally negative uh, uh, from the point of view especially of the way that the exhibition works uh, uh, in terms of its technology so that's an interesting angle for me to take uh, because I am a huge huge fan of of Bjork and and I was kind of uh, annoyed that I probably won't be able to go to New York uh, this year to go and see it and uh, and, uh, it's interesting to, to read these reviews because they talk about the fact that you know the the, the concept is very good, but the execution on the technology points li- leaves a lot uh, leaves a lot to be desired. And also, if they, they have they had question marks around what would happen when actually the the actual people are in, because a lot of the the exhibits are quite uh, uh, you know they take a long time to to visit, and, and there's a restricted number of people that can actually be in in the room. Uh, and so uh, a very interesting uh, story there, because obviously this is kind of the pinnacle of her career as an artist in, in, to a certain degree, just because it's such it's, uh, there's so much uh, prestige in 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 doing a you know a, a solo exhibition essentially at, at MoMA. So, uh, Joe, have you have you heard about anybody that has gone yet uh, uh, over in New York, and, and w- what's the feeling around there? I haven't heard anyone go yet. Uh, I think it's interesting that she's kind of uh, put in the tabloids, at least put against Matthew Barney uh, playing in uh, in LA at the same time. Uh, I I feel like we're in this kind of first or second wave of technical curators, and so it's going to take a little while to to kind of shake out. Right. Uh, a lot of the folks that are now in, in the kind of roles where they would be curating a, a exhibition that size haven't probably done it um, at that scale before and, and, you know, have a certain different kind of skills. And so it's very experimental, both from the, the 
cultural experience as as much as it is for for Robbie for Bjork. And so uh, I think it's it's a great attempt, and I think we'll continue to see more and more of these kind of uh, linked exhibitions where there's a, a pretty highly technical component in, in it. Yeah. at a scale like like there. Yeah, exactly. Jim, from your point of view, do you think that technology can ruin an exhibition if if, mm-hmm. if it uh, gets in the way of it? Well, in, in this case, I mean, I interviewed Bjork last week and, like, I mean, the, at the end of the interview, she was heading off to MoMA to, or the week before, she was like, heading off to MoMA to test out the, 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 those particular apps, especially the technology. And it's one, it's one thing that she was really concerned with. She was really concerned with many things to do with the exhibition in this interview. She didn't want to be all about the dresses and the gowns. Um, she also was very worried about, like, how do exactly do you, do you exhibit songs on, on, on songs on a wall? I mean, how do you hang the songs on the wall? She didn't want to be, like, say, that awful experience museum over in Seattle, which is just full of clothes of dead people. She didn't want that. And when it came to the app, she was particularly kind of like, she said that they'd, they'd spend it forever on the biophilia apps, like just working and working because they had a the time. In this case, they didn't because the deadline was March the 8th when the exhibition opens. They had to be out there. She did say that there will be touring. So, I mean, there will be chances, I suppose, to kind of like, I mean, like improve it, improve the experience as it goes along. But like, you know, as Joe kind of pointed out as well, I mean, the, 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 there's particular sections of the exhibition that haven't been to see it. Um, I hope to get there later on this month. But there's particular pits which are kind of limited in terms of crowd. And when, a, when an audience kind of moves into a space like that, no matter what the curators or the creators think, you know, they they kind of like mean take to the apps, they take to the, they take to the exhibits in a totally different way sometimes than was intended. I mean, you think of, of the um, you think of the David Bowie David Bowie's exhibition, which was at the kind of like the Tate recently. You know, I mean, that was a fantastic exhibition. But uh, I think the reason why it was fantastic was probably for a lot of reasons. That I remember talking to Paul Morley, the curator of that one, and he kind of said the way people kind of like like uh, embraced Bowie was in a totally different way than what they intended. It was about Bowie as a national treasure, a national icon. I think in the case of Bjork, I mean, she is the one artist I can think of right now that can bring so many people together because every single thing she's done in her career has been kind of like so 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 unusual. It's been definitely it's been definitely different than what she's done before, you know. Yeah. In terms of like I mean the digital side, I mean it will be interesting to do. I mean there there are a lot of uh, uh, galleries who try to be in this space in terms of like bringing music and tech together and doing something with something something like this. But it's also I, I don't know there, there there seems to be something missing, and I don't know whether it's the kind of like the tech hard neck or the real artistic vision. Well, yeah. I have yet to come across a sort of like me a, a, a digital based exhibition in, 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 in the kind of pop arts culture sphere, which really, really works. Yeah, and it's very difficult to create, as, as, as you were mentioning, you know, her concern around how you hang music. It's very difficult to create a good experience around a music exhibit. Uh, I mean, we've seen in the UK, we had a, years ago, there was a failed museum that was uh, built, in, they spent millions of pounds on it in, in Sheffield, I believe it was, and it got clo- shut down within you know, three or four months of, of, of opening. It was on popular music. And then we had the Br- British Music Experience, which opened right next to the O2 Arena uh, in London, which you'd have, you'd have thought, you know, it's next to the O2 Arena, there's gigs there every night. This place is going to be packed but it actually shut down for a uh, lack of visitors uh, uh, I think last year uh, so it, but the exhibit wasn't very good you know the, the technology that implemented there had become obsolete by sort of six months after they opened the exhibit and so it feels like almost uh, this kind of spaces need to move to an entirely perhaps app based exhibition environment where there's actually no physical technological things to do like you know you would in a you know in a science museum but where everything is triggered by a device and the device can be upgraded and so you don't have to have that worry of spending two million pounds on all these buttons that you have to press and all these things that screens and things that have to happen that are all fixed mm. and all those those things are going to be you know in, in, five, in four years they're going to look totally like old school and 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 you're going to have to completely change them so Every every museum has to be a software company too now. Um, they can't just buy it once and run away. There's it's moving too quickly, and there's there's a lot of moving parts uh, between eye beacons and the other experiential things you have to do with the museum versus the just keeping the the software up to date and relevant and current, uh, which is actually an interesting way to continue the experience and it makes people come back if it keeps changing. So. I think you'll see like the the software engineer as a gallerist uh, yeah. profession, uh, you know, emerge at some point. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by that. And uh, uh, and uh, who knows? Maybe they'll have some sort of Apple Watch integration. And talking about Apple Watch, uh, I won't uh, you know delve too much into the announcement itself because it has had pretty much nothing to do with music aside from the Shazam, uh, you know, showcase. Which you know, Apple has got very tight links with Shazam, so it made sense for them to showcase that up at the at the presentation. But uh, uh, the interesting thing is that the streaming service apparently is going to be priced at nine dollars ninety nine as opposed to seven ninety nine as it was previously rumored uh, because the the label 
was essentially pus pushed back and uh, in this kind of latest spree of uh, valuing paying subscribers they said no actually we don't want to discount the subscription which I guess is good news for, for Spotify and other competitors uh, but uh, there's a question mark as to whether uh, a lower price would have opened up the market to more subscribers although arguably between 7.99 and 9.99 not that much of a difference really uh, uh, Joe what are your thoughts on that do you think that that was a, a good or a bad move for the music industry to stand up and say well actually we want to keep it at, at ten dollars a month it completely remains to be seen i mean you have instances where they are allowing people uh to pay less like on cricket or other bundled services so i uh, you know arpu is is always the big thing that the, the majors are touting now and i think that's a great idea and a great concept the whether or not how beats rolls us out is going to be interesting and particularly as it relates to how Music Key comes out and, and fights against this as well, and what kind of partnerships Spotify continues to eke out as uh, brands who cannot be in in the in the camp of Google or in the camp of Apple uh, right. try to pick up the pieces there. So, as a consumer, you know, am I going to get two three months free on when I buy my new iPhone, and is that going to hook me? I mean, they're going to do a lot of research on that. Um, and I think they're taking their time to make the product a lot better, make it a much more integrated experience. They're going to give Beats whatever extra benefits that you're not going to get on Spotify, yeah. because it's going to be they're going to they own the platform and they own you know end to end, which is something that Spotify will never get. Um, will we see Music Key try to follow that? I don't know. The there is a pretty big divide internally at Google between the Google Play team and the YouTube Music Key team that is slowly starting to come together, but you have some pretty big fiefdoms between both the Android teams and the, the YouTube teams uh, in terms of their product development life cycles and in terms of just how they think about the world. Which is mental, because you'd think, you know, the two things just kind of mm -hmm. go together, put them together, right? <laughs> giant, <laughs> giant company, uh, yeah. you know, very, very different um, priorities and different visions of, of what the world should look like and, and how important music is. Music is incredibly incredibly important YouTube right now. Yeah, They see it as probably their number one vertical uh, outside of creators, I think. And, and I would also argue that musicians are creators now and they, they use the platform in, in really interesting ways. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the edge that they have against Apple is that they have this creator engagement, but they don't have the major artist engagement. And I think that's where Beats could shine through in terms of reaching out, using Jimmy uh, to, to, really, to really move things there. Yeah, uh, Jim, Jim, 799 or 999, do you think moves the needle at all or, or not? Well, no, because I mean, what, what, I suppose what we're, what we're going to see this year when, when Beats Apple come, comes out is that like, you know, there will be more of a move away, try, try and get away from free and make it kind of like pay to play. If, if, if consumers want to kind of stream, they're going to have to pay. And like you can see, you can see the moves being on with Universal, with the shenanigans that are going on there. You can see kind of like I me mean, how Apple can kind of go, OK, well, I mean, if labels want this, we want kind of labels on board to get into, get into people that won't be won over by like meeting Jimmy or Dr. Dre. But like, you know, you, you can see you can see where it's kind of going to go. But, like, I mean, you see, there's a generation coming up. It's interesting. We're doing a banter talk tonight on Generation Z and, like, I mean, their attitude, everything, life, the universe, and everything from music to technology to politics, you know? And, like, I mean, they're a generation who've grown up and, like, you know, music is just, music is there, you know? They're not paying for it, you know what I mean? They don't, they don't realize, that actually, there's a parent who's paying for the broadband connection in the first place. They don't realize that, like, in the year, years gone by, the parent paid for actual physical disc and whatever. And, like... Will they will they pay for their music kind of like being falling on? And like it will be interesting to see will there be some will there be some interesting plays to kind of hook them up? Because I do think the price point is quite significant. I mean, the, the very the very interesting thing that I come across is Spotify that I hadn't seen before. And like I mean, there's 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 two people in, in, in the house here who use Spotify all the time, and you know we both we have separate Spotify accounts. But then your Spotify family means that you're getting the same thing for 15, 15 euros, which is seven fifty each, which is like okay, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good deal. So I mean, but right. that's not well advertised. You know, it's almost like I mean the need to kind of be more price points and need to be more bundles and need to be more like interesting offerings to hook in people who maybe haven't thought about being about paying before but there will always be a significant proportion of people who will not pay for music right yeah and, and that that spread between price point i think will actually play out really interesting around christmas this yeah. year can you gift your kid a beat subscription this year i think that answer is going to be yes and is it going to be a hundred dollars i don't know is it going to be 120 dollars? i think there's a big difference between paying a hundred dollars for your kids christmas gift versus 120 how does that affect it can they discount it there um people love giving apple uh itunes gift cards for christmas so 
maybe there's some play in there. That's a, such a huge, huge market. So we'll see what happens there. One of the things that I didn't get the chance to talk about last week was the fact that uh, Spotify has released an update to its uh, desktop app, uh, which uh, integrates uh, lyrics uh, uh, natively uh, in, in view, obviously, of the fa- uh, you know of the uh, fading out of uh, 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 the uh, app ecosystem within the desktop experience. And so they've integrated with the Music Match. It's a big coup for the company to be integrated within Spotify. I'm sure that's a, that's a, a pretty uh, a, a decent chunk of money coming in from that partnership. Uh, and also on the friend feed front the, the company has made it easier to find out what people you follow listening to and uh, see what artists and songs and playlists they are enjoying so uh, and finally the company has introduced a daily viral chart that displayed displays the most uh, shared tracks around the world and uh, in a user's uh, given particular region and so uh, all these changes uh, coming into the desktop player all pretty much overdue uh, do you think that uh, Spotify is preparing for this Apple launch uh, and uh, do you think they might have something up their sleeve uh, that uh, uh, could, you know, make a bit of a splash once uh, Apple announces that they can sort of counter uh, with uh, at all, Jim? Yeah, I mean, like you, you, you said it there, there, there are changes and there are iterations which are long overdue, you know? I mean, like Spotify, kind of like me, sat in their laurels, to be honest, you know? They, they, and, but at the same time, everything you've just described, all those new additions that you've just talked about, like, I mean, is that going to persuade someone to pay for Spotify? You know, I mean, that that, it, that sounds like you going back to what we were just talking about there about like you know uh, about price points as well. I mean, like what are the, what are the additions that Spotify need to make in order to make more people pay and and turn kind of like I mean current people who are free users into into premium users? And like if, if you ask all those people, I kind of bet you that, that the the majority chunk of that people. 60 to 70 cents people will, will talk about price, you know. It's all very well to kind of offer these new, these new ideas, these new iterations, these new bits and pieces, lyrics, yada, yada, yada. And for some people, that's, that's cool. Some people will, will, will take that. But most important people, it will come back to price. They're, and, like, I mean, will they, will they basically, like, I mean, bring the price down? Will they introduce some deep discounts, you know? And that's, it, it's going to be a price war as well. That, that, when, when, Apple, when Apple kind of, like, roll it out, that's when you'll see Spotify kind of going, okay, we have to, we have to kind of fight our corner here. And the yeah. way they're going to fight their corner, I reckon, is going to be on price rather than anything else. They're so? gearing up for the biggest battle of their life. I mean, and they've had a, they're in a really interesting position as a company because they've had a pretty significant turnover on the product side uh, just because of the age of the company and because it's been hard to find really talented folks that want to go fight that fight uh, against an adversary that is is obviously quite (laughs) difficult to fight. Um, I think that this Music Match thing is great as a publisher. Anytime people are using lyrics and bring that back in the conversation, we're of course super, super excited. Music Match has has provided a great service uh, from its app, and and um, it's nice to see a a really cool integration like this. I hope they do this with more streaming providers, and I hope that more streaming providers understand how important lyrics are. it's how it's a really compelling part of the experience. Yeah, and it was interesting to see actually on the on the Apple Watch, uh, one of the first things that, that was actually quite cool was the fact that when you Shazam the tracks, the lyrics started scrolling on the Apple Watch uh, uh, right there in sync with the track. So that, that I thought was a pretty neat uh, thing uh, from the watch itself, which, uh, you know... Uh, it's got some really nice use cases, but just a very short battery life. So I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get Gen One. I'm gonna skip on that. I'm gonna. I, I've always t- uh, taken Gen Two of any Apple products. So I think that that would prove true this time around as well. Well, Jim, I will, we're gonna let you go because you you, you have to dash to, to a meeting. But uh, give us two bands that people should check out of South by Southwest if you have any, any in mind. Oh, okay, two bands people should check out South by Southwest. Uh, oh. Oh, Summer Heart. Summer Heart in Sweden. I really like, I, I, there's a track of theirs that I've, I've, been, I've been playing an awful lot. Uh, I, I, really, I really like where they're coming from. That's definitely one, one act I'll be checking out of South Southwest. And the other act, I'm just kind of look, just looking here because it's one of those sure, things. Of there's, there's so many lists on my, on my system <laughs> at the moment. There's an act called Genevieve. She's a pop act. I know very little about her, about her track called Colors. And uh, that's been, that, I've been liking that a lot. Other acts as well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to just stick to two. You know that, Andrea. Uh, will be Kaleo from uh, Iceland. And there's a great, there's a great lad. Um, I know. Again, he just came up last week as a recommendation from NP, uh, NPR. Madison Ward and the Mama Bear. Madison Ward and the Mama Bear. And I've listed that album for uh, all week. I really like that. So there's some tips for people to check out. Oh, uh, Jim, thanks so much for your time today, and have a great trip. Thanks very much. Bye bye. 
So uh, last week, uh, the Songwriter Equity Act had been reintroduced in, in the, in the uh, uh, Congress uh, by Congressman uh, Doug Collins and Senator Orrin Hatch uh, after failing to pass before the end of the 113th congressional term, uh, Billboard uh, re reported. And so uh, the, the Songwriter Equity Act is interesting because essentially it, it goes alongside uh, some of the uh, recommendations that the Copyright Office had made, but in a totally, you know, piece me away whilst the Copyright Office actually recommended trying to address some of these issues uh, uh, comprehensively. Uh, the Act specifically focuses on section 114 and 115 and uh, uh, the changes would enable the rate court to consider other royalty rates as evidence when deciding fair rate standards and this would include considering uh, those paid for master recording which is, would be a really big change for uh, uh, the way royalty rates are, 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 are uh, worked out. So Joe, from your perspective, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Uh, you know, we, we I've heard a lot of different opinions about this act, and uh, I'd like to hear yours. I'll throw the all branch out to the labels. I think it's uh, it's finally about time that you know they get their fair share on radio. Uh, it's it's already kind of happening. I mean, Taylor Swift is getting yeah. paid for it. You're seeing the the kind of you know broker deal there that happened. Whether or not uh, it happens this this year it remains to be seen. I think this year we'll see a lot less of these kind of um, out of the woods people come out and say, hey, you need to put my thing in this bill. I mean, uh, <laughs> last, last time it was a lot of like, let's, we need to put FM transmitters in every, every cell phone and all these other, you know, kind of things that we thought we had already gotten past. Yeah, so I hope right. that that talk has gone this year. I think, um, hopefully it will be decided that, that, that piece of the label side does happen. I would like to see, uh, you know, additional testimony. And, and, and I think that with the con with the with the various copyright reform that came out last week, that provides a pretty good stance of where where the judiciary is at with this, and especially with the judiciary committees this week. Now, can the Congress catch up with that uh, and and understand that is is a whole other story. Um, the two gentlemen who who's due sponsor bill do understand most of the issues here, and they um, have a pretty good nuance of fr from being so far removed from the actual day to day. Yeah. Um, the songwriters, you know, there's a lot of talk about they're not getting, they're going to be paid attention to in this, and well, the reality is that most songwriters are still their own publishers, uh, and so when people kind of lambast the, the idea that the publishers are somehow, um, you know, uh, asserting their 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 power and what have you. Well, that songwriters are publishers. You, yeah. you write your song, you're the publisher. <laughs> I I for one represent you know many many th tens of thousands of songwriters, and they I'm I'm just administering their copyrights as their sub publisher effectively. And so so giving them their own power is is for my clients very important from the song trust perspective and from the downtown perspective. We of course have um, you know a whole host of things we'd like to see done. I, whether or not this reform passes this year or, or gets tacked to another bill would be exciting, but I, I don't know if we've really hashed out all the details, yeah. especially with the consent decree being such a wrench around yeah. um, what's happening here. And, and you know, hearing ask, I didn't get all, I did watch all the uh, Judiciary Committee yesterday, but uh, I did get to get uh, a bit of ASCAP and, and Pandora's back and forth. And it just doesn't seem like everyone's on the same page. We kind of have two very separate <laughs> um, Two very separate, very real issues. Um, Pandora is is paying a lower rate than they should, and they know they're going to have to capitulate at some point. Unfortunately, it's getting be, it's getting lumped into what is a wider conversation about what is the role of a PRO in 2015. Yeah, and it's a tough it's a tough world out there for them. Even though they are showing re you know record revenues, should those revenues be higher or lower, or you Absolutely. know where should they be? Absolutely, and, and I mean it's kind of interesting because uh, we're seeing all these moves around uh, sort of uh, the, the role, future role of the PROs. At the same time, we've seen ASCAP, uh, you know, sort of release their highest earnings ever for 2014. You know, the, the highest uh, uh, they collected the highest amount of uh, royalties ever uh, with over one billion dollars, uh, and that's actually the highest ever reported by a collection society worldwide. So definitely not a, a society that is doing badly. It's just interesting to well, see. Well, I would say they are definitely threatened. I can't say you know. The thing about Piero is the size of the mu music market is going to grow every year. There are more people in this world. Yeah. So if it doesn't go up, you'd be really concerned. Now, is it going up enough is right. the big question. And there, there, there's significant competition against BMI, ASCAP, CSAC with the entrance of Global Music Rights or GMR and CSAC now being more of an active player in that world. So they each are competing against each other and that's you know a pay 
PayPal to or Rob Peter PayPal situation where they're taking monies from the current balances of uh, songwriters payouts for this quarter and paying it to as an advance to another songwriter to keep them right which is uh it's tough for all the songwriters so yes the revenues are up but are the payouts in actuality you know really going the way we need them to um are they properly funded are they able to operate a these these giant businesses effectively uh, instead of having to just continue to deal with lawsuits and and infighting between bureaus there there it's it's a very tumultuous time for, for all the heroes. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, let's uh, talk about uh uh, let's talk about uh, Cobalt because uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting, you know, conversation, uh, and it's all it's all all the different subjects that we talk about when we talk about publishing and and and, and royalties. Uh, they're all hinge around a few different issues, which are, you know, obviously you talk about consent decrees, and we talk about uh, uh, you know the fair share for songwriters versus masters, but also transparency is a huge issue in the industry still because a lot of songwriters still don't you know don't really know where their money is coming from and so uh, being able to display them where that money comes from in a, in a more uh, in a more in, you know visual in, in, in a precise way is really important for the next few years and so cobalt interestingly uh, raised a, a new round of funding uh, of 60 million dollars a series c uh, which was led by google ventures actually interestingly because they own youtube and so uh, and uh, the other key uh, players are existing investors uh, msd capital uh, the private fund belonging to michael dell uh, and uh, MSDC management and so uh, this adds up to the 60 million, 66 million already raised and uh, once again it kind of goes to highlight the role of Cobalt as a technology company rather than as a publisher uh, I'm sure I've said this before on the show but a few years ago uh, when I first started working with Cobalt on a few licensing deals I, I honestly thought that Cobalt was a publisher I mean obviously they were doing things differently as uh, administrating uh, the, the rights rather than actually having owning the rights uh, but I, I still saw them as a publisher whilst you know in, in the last couple of years they have really uh, shown themselves to be a technology company so from your end what what does this say about our industry this kind of investment and also you guys also do a lot of work on that front and i know song trust has a has a whole host of like uh, uh, its own services ar around providing so what is more uh, awareness of, of where their money is coming from so i think this this raise shows that there's an interest in the space from from wider uh wider and more more in different industries and you're, you're seeing how how music is becoming a an interesting place to think about uh data in and um the costs are obviously changing and uh it's requiring a little bit more more you know capital to do certain things i think that they have you know this is pretty much growth capital for them from from my perspective they have they're now operating three different businesses they're not really just a publisher I wouldn't say they're just a pure play technology either. They're, you know, they're just a music industry uh, generalist at this point. They do label services, they do rights, uh, neighboring rights, etc. Um, whether or not this is going to be used to buy additional uh, catalog or or try to finance whatever, it remains to be seen. So, is it more of just a typical kind of uh, this is growth capital or is this a, a technology play? I don't know if there's really sixty million dot worth of technology to build in this space. As someone who would love to spend sixty million dollars building technology <laughs> space. I just don't think I could. I think it'd be it'd be quite. Uh, it'd be. A, I. I mean, I could spend it, but I, don't know if I should. Um, I think I'd do it for a lot less. But uh, you know, maybe that's my perspective, and maybe they have uh, different different plans. I think what it does mean is that uh, you know, there's. It's always good to have more competition at, for for the customers here, for the for the end clients, the songwriters, artists, and what have you. So I think that. It's a. It's going to be a positive signal for everyone. Um, I think that uh, you know whether or not um, where they head and and if there's some sort of play with YouTube there, it remains to be seen. I mean, I think YouTube has a pretty good technology staff being inside of Google already. I don't know if sure. they need to go outside of their own in-house thing or if this is just the uh, the Google Ventures arm yeah. just playing with its own money. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, uh, the interesting thing is that I guess, you know, th there's so few people that are willing to invest that, that amount of money in creating the technology that if that is actually required, that's the question Mark, you, you, you uh, very well raised, uh, you know, if that is required and nobody else is doing it, then Cobalt could end up with like a, a platform that at least has a backbone uh, to which other publishers could hook up, hook up to uh, could be pretty valuable as far as, f you know, figuring out where the different streams are coming from. So uh, we'll see how that ends up really uh, and uh, and uh, uh, finally Joe uh, uh, just uh, give us a, a you know a, 
a rundown of a couple of events that you think are going to be awesome at South by either panels or a band that you really want to see. Yeah, it's going to be uh, obviously going to going to go see X Cops because that's going to be fun Absolutely. to see how they they talk about whatever <laughs> uh, events have gone down. Um, there's going to be a producer songwriter uh, panel that has some really really interesting folks going on there. Uh, there is a units versus ARPU. A bunch of label guys going to get nerdy. I think. Um, John, nice. Tom Silverman and, and John Dorkin are going to talk about ARPU, which they are the foremost experts in the world, so that should be interesting. I believe that's Friday. Um, I would love to see Snoop Dogg. I don't think I'm going to have time, but... Uh, <laughs> you I'm never have time for anything, out. right? <laughs> it's yeah, you know, that's, it's so you're just running around and, and doing everything. So exactly. I will try to look out at Summer Hearts at Jim. It sounded, it sounded interesting, he mentioned, so we'll see what happens. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, to, thank anybody, you. to anybody that is heading to South by Southwest uh, or is possibly listening to this podcast uh, whilst on the plane to South by Southwest, uh, uh, have a great festival. We have uh, something planned with DMT uh, where I'm going to get a bunch of people or call in uh, from South by. If they are, you know, uh, managed to get up in the morning and call me before they uh, get out of the door and give me some updates on uh, what's going on there. So hopefully we'll have an interesting episode uh, uh, both next week and the week after with a few reports uh, from the ground and thanks so much for listening to DMT it comes out every week thanks again to our sponsor Gramophone do go and check out uh, uh, Gramophone.com uh, for all the info on this uh, uh, pretty neat little box uh, to connect your uh, existing speakers uh, uh, to your uh, mobile phone and uh, thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and until next time